Clinker Factor, the cement industry podcast. Well, welcome to episode five of the Clinker Factor, a podcast from WCA, which looks at the cement industry's response to climate change around the world. I'm Ian Riley, CEO of WCA, and your host on the Clinker Factor. In this episode, we're going to turn our attention to Africa, and I'm delighted to have two people with long experience in the cement industry there. Uh, the first of these is uh, Makate Ramafoko. And Makate is a South African. He's the managing director of PPC International. And he's passionate about the African continent and the associated opportunities. Uh, we both used to work for Holcim and, and we both share interests in, in travel and history. So welcome, Makate. The second is uh, Tony Hadley. Uh, Tony started his career in the oil industry and uh, it came into the cement industry in uh, 1999 in Blue Circle and then in Lafarge and later Dan Gothe. Uh, so he now runs a high level cement strategy and performance focus consultancy and an investment firm. So uh, McCarthy, let me come to you first and ask you to tell us a bit about your background and in particular, how you got involved in the cement industry. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ian. Um, <clears throat> my background, actually, I, I studied sciences, um, and later I, I specialized in uh, what you call metallurgy, um, specifically focusing on pyroprocessing. And my career began actually in PPC, coincidentally, in, in 1995. Um, uh, PPC sponsored actually my final year of studies, and that's how my relationship with PPC started. Uh, and I've been in operations uh, most part of my life. Um, I've also moved from operations as, as from a line management role uh, into a technical role. Uh, in fact, uh, when I moved into a technical role is at a time when PPC was busy, you know, um, uh, working towards the African growth strategy uh, with all the investments that uh, eventually happened outside of South Africa. In terms of my involvement, Ian, um, I'm looking after basically four business units outside out of South Africa. Uh, one is in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, we basically have three operations. We have a Tlinka facility between the border of South Africa and Bulawayo. We have a grinding station of about 700,000 tons in Bulawayo and a grinding station in Harare. Further north, um, in, in, in Rwanda, we actually invested into a brownfield uh, a business. Eventually, we commissioned the plant in, 19, in 2015. Um, we have a 600,000 ton per annum um, clinker facility there. It's a, it's a precalcina kiln. Uh, with capabilities to, to deal with issues of, uh, or to ban alternative fuels. Up north, uh, we also have an operation uh, in Ethiopia where we own only 38% shareholding in that business. Um, it's also a modern kiln line uh, capable um, of banning uh, secondary fuels. Um, also, you know, in terms of uh, the topic that we'll be covering today around clinker ratio, uh, we have um, advantage of, of, of having a pumice uh, in that market for cement extension. On the other side of the Kivu, Kivu Lake uh, in the DRC, uh, we also have a, a modern kiln. Um, I think it's, it's actually our state-of-the-art facility with uh, pre cyanide and uh, vertical roller mill uh, in terms of energy efficiency. Unfortunately, on the Western part, you know, for, for, for uh, cement extension, what is available at the moment is limestone, and we are looking at the other options. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Tony, maybe I can uh, turn, turn to you and ask you the same question. How did you get involved in the cement industry? And maybe you can also uh, uh, take us on a small tour of uh, what, what you're up to and what you're involved in in Africa. Okay, uh, thanks Ian. So uh, my, my background was Imperial College in London where I studied uh, mechanical engineering, joined the oil industry. Um, and in 1999, I got headhunted to the Blue Circle, which was in kind of mass transition um, at, at that time. And they asked me to run, run and build the African business. Uh, so we, we acquired a couple of businesses in, well, we acquired control of a couple of businesses in, in Nigeria. We bought a portfolio in Southeast Africa. Uh, by that time, uh, Blue Circle was being acquired by Lafarge. And um, the, the chairman of Lafarge asked me to establish a, a region for Afri Africa, which they didn't have. Um, so we, we, we built a very, very nice portfolio. We developed some super teams, uh, African teams, 
recruiting a lot of young people uh, into the businesses from many, many with international experience, bringing them back to their countries. And 15 years later, many of those guys are running some of the biggest companies all, all around Africa, not only in, in cement. Ali Kudangoti had been asking me to join uh, his business. So I moved across to work for for Dangoti to head up Dangoti Cement and work, worked with Dangoti on building a team for the business, very much performance focused culture. I suppose that uh, the perception that I have is that uh, it's, it's difficult to find enough people with the right skills who are, are willing to live at cement plant locations. Do you, do you feel that that's um, the right characterization of the issue, Makate? Um, thanks, and uh, correct. I think, um, uh, unfortunately, most of the cement operations are located in uh, quite remote areas, uh, not very attractive, uh, especially for the young talent. Uh, most of them, they prefer, you know, some sort of an urban, urban life. Um, but that's 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 the one issue uh, for me. Uh, the experience of 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 got it in the continent, uh, in particular in some of these uh, markets outside of South Africa, is um, the level of industrialization. Because you know, often you'll pick up uh, some of these skills um, from other industrialized or from other industries in a country. But um, if you take a country like Rwanda, where you know the bulk of the GDP comes from a services sector. Uh, it's very difficult to find, um, you know, locally prepared resources that are able to um, take the rain and um, and run the business. So it requires a very deliberate uh, program um, to really capacitate um, the talent that you can find. And as Tony said, we've also done quite a lot of extensive search to bring in some of the diasporas. But you find in other areas where you know there's a there's a huge pool of talent available in the market. Um, but that pool might be what I call rough diamonds that requires quite a lot of effort to polish them and really um, uh, get them to, to, to operate at a higher level. And a, a country like Zimbabwe is a classical example where over the years, I think uh, the country did very well in terms of the education system. Um, but exposure is quite key as well. You know, what I find as well in these uh, markets is diversity is so important. Um, you know, if you bring people that grew up in the same environment together, you start having a common uh, mindset um, and, let, you know, an environment where uh, ideas are not uh, fully challenged. And you need, you need to have one or two th or three people in any business that are come from, coming from a completely different environment to create that, uh, um, uh, you know, environment where we can challenge each other in terms of our thinking. So that's very important. And that's really my experience uh, in the last few years uh, working in the, in the continent. Okay. So, so Tony, you also mentioned the importance of, of teams. I mean, what did you see as the, the main challenges in building a team in Africa and how might those differ from other parts of the world? Is the skill base, the industrial skill base, Africa is about trade historically rather than about industrial production. And we, we've, we've only seen in the last 10 years really the true development of industrial or 10, 15 years of industrial entrepreneurs who are African. Uh, there's been the multinationals. So I, I think pool, the pool is not very deep. Pumping talent in at the bottom to get to the objective 5, 10 or 15 or even 20 years years later. So I think it's, you've got to be visionary. You've got to be patient. You've got to decide what you want and execute it. Again, there is the, there's the difficulty of the remote plants, the balances of culture in, the, in those plants, and also the need, as McCarthy highlights, to move, move people around. Okay, that sounds, uh, sounds very optimistic and very um, a positive view of the opportunities there. So maybe we could uh, uh, turn to uh, sustainability and um, uh, talk about some of the issues. So uh, uh, you already mentioned a little bit about uh, the cementitious materials you're, you're using around the, 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 the uh, continent. Uh, and clearly uh, use of more cementitious is one of the biggest levers we've got in terms of reducing our CO2 footprint and reducing the clinker usage. So could you just... Um, Give us a summary of where you are and some of the challenges that you face and where you think there might be opportunities to expand the use of cementitious. 
Um, yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, <clears throat> look, we, I mean, coming from uh, being a South African, um, I think the one thing that is, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether I should call it a blessing or a curse, because I think, uh, you know, with the, with the economy driven primarily by thermal coal-fired power stations, um, we've been blessed to have abundance of ash in the market that has been, you know, quite instrumental in the country's um, effort to drive the clinker factor down. Um, but also at the same time, it has created opportunities, um, you know, for what we call blenders in this country, people who buy base product and, and, and they blend, they buy ash and blend, uh, put a little uh, low capital investment facility and blend the cement and then sell it to the market. Um, however, if you look at, um, you know, what, what, what we've been able to achieve as a country with regards to the use of ash, it has enabled us to really, um, over the years, drive um, the clink factor down. I remember during my old sim days, I mean, in a, you know, in 2010, one of the key strategic objectives was to, to lower the clink factor to less than 65%. Um, and I, at the time, you know, I was, I was part of the group and one deliberate uh, decision was to relook at um, or to look at how we engineered the clinker to allow us to get to those extension levels. And this is for me, one of the fundamental steps that you need uh, when you start talking about the uh, reduction of the clinker factor is how do you engineer this beautiful base product called clinker to be able to give you a, you know, a good performance with as little as possible uh, content in the final product. So there, 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 are, there are a lot of options. Um, in other markets, um, a country like Rwanda, we are blessed because we have a huge Pozzolana deposit, um, less than 10 kilometers from our operation, which really gives us a, a huge benefit from an extension point of view. Um, but obviously Pozzolana, you know, you've got different Pozzolanas, you've got fairly you know, highly reactive Pozzolana, you've got uh, uh, Pozzolana that is not extremely reactive. So we've got, um, yeah, you know, we're focusing on how we can actually blend to um, to um, arrive at an optimum clinker factor, which is, you know, I think, and, I, and the business has done quite quite well. I, if I look at Rwanda, you know, last uh, um, the last eighteen months, we've been able to reduce our clinker factor, you know, by more than five percent. The the alternative fuels in in Africa. Can you give me a sort of brief? thumbnail sketch of, of the situation there? Because generally it depends very much on the regulatory framework, doesn't it, uh, as to what's available? So I think getting alternate fuels in Africa is remarkably simple, perhaps with the South Africa being a little bit trickier. So firstly, obviously there's, there's, there's availability, but I, I think overall the, the industry in Africa has been exceedingly poor on the alternate fuel side. And um, we can go back into all the reasons for that, it doesn't matter. But uh, when we bought Hema cement in Uganda, within three or four years, we were running over 50% alternate fuels with coffee husk, a bit of rice husks. And so it was, there was nothing to say, you couldn't get to more than 50%, but it was a very much uh, one, one island in a, in, in a sea, there was no, no other stuff happening. There's a bit more happening. In Nigeria, Lafarge have made some advances on, on biomass. There's a bit of stuff being done in Kenya. PPC have got some stuff in, in, in the Cape, but, but very, very low. And in general, alternate fuels are still quite underdeveloped. The Egyptians are further ahead, particularly with RDF. McCarthy's mentioned calcined clay LC3. We're just issuing an article today on, it, it's a three layer article. One is the massive overcapacity that has developed now in West Africa, which we saw previously in uh, East Africa. So we're saying West Africa is already in and it will get worse, the turmoil. There will be bankruptcies, uh, consolidation, etc. We look at Ivory Coast specifically, where there is 12.7 million tons of capacity for a 5 million ton market, and already the, the prices have collapsed and companies cannot get the working capital to survive. So I think that's gonna be very interesting over the next six to 12 months. But even more importantly, 
in Ivory Coast is Simpo Oyak have commissioned Africa's first, and in fact, outside the Americas, first calcine clay plant. So we've been running the economics on that, both on a carbon point of view and the cost point of view. We see it as being rather transformational on a cost point of view, because there's, there's a bit of an issue at the moment in the LC350 is replacing 52.5. And not enough work has been done yet on calcine clay 42 and 32.5. But it will happen. So we think it's transformational. And if you haven't got calcine clay and you're importing clinker, you're a dead man, I'm sorry to say. You, 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 you won't be able to compete if the calcine clay player chooses to, to drop prices further. So I think it's very, very interesting. But also an, another, another critical point that we believe in is carbon is the future of the world. So we, we're encouraging our clients to think very set, carefully about carbon, become a leader proactively, and then proactively go to the governments to introduce if they don't exist or increase the cost of carbon in, um, in, in, in those markets. And the, the carbon footprint of LC3 is approximately 25, 30% of the carbon footprint of Clinker. So I think we're gonna see some real transformational stuff and people have got to dig their head out of the sand and look forward and start moving to make sure that they're not left in a very weak strategic position because of a failure to face the reality of a new carbon world. McCarthy, maybe you'd like to comment on LC3 before we just uh, go back to uh, AFR, because I think that the points that Tony make are very interesting. And this plant, the simple plant uh, in uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, is something that they're very excited about, and they 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 really believe it'll it, it'll transform their business in in uh, that area. Um, correct. Yeah, I mean we've been following uh, this project with keen interest. Um, internally, we've also done, you know, some work um, around this topic. Uh, we've done some modeling. Um, in the in the current form, I think um, where we have. Um, um, we still have good extenders and the concept does not make sense yet. Um, but from, a, from an R&D point of view, there's a lot of work that has been done uh, internally to see what are the options uh, beyond, um, you know, once we start reaching the maximum uh, extension with uh, flyer, slack or whatever, what else can we do? Because like Tony says, I mean, there's, uh, there's still quite a lot of work uh, that still needs to be done with um, um, calcine clay on other products. Um, and we still need to see whether, you know, you know, some of these um, uh, extension levels will be approved by the, by the, by the technical committee. And once that, uh, I mean, we are also part of the crew that is lobbying, obviously, uh, in South Africa, as well as uh, the Cement Association is also engaging the, the regulator to see, you know, um, whether um, we can amend um, the, the standards uh, in, in the country. In other markets, um, you know, the regulators are not quite active, um, but as an industry, we need to take a leading role in actually you know promoting the use of calcium and clay so there's a, there's a lot of work internally that's, that's going on also out, 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 out of south africa looking at our options uh, with regards to you know what can be done uh, in the future because it's very clear i mean we we also have a, a long-term plan to to reduce our carbon footprint uh, quite significantly in the next five years we actually have five ten year uh, plans to see if we can also um you know, get below 600 uh, um, uh, kilograms per ton of uh, uh, of CO2 per ton of uh, uh, cement, um, and that's that's quite key for us. Um, you know, we've got uh, we're actually um, a member of this climate change initiative, and we want to really uh, drive uh, some of these issues um, as part of our strategic uh, objectives. Um, can you tell us what you're doing with AFR in, in PPC? Uh, and um, uh, so perhaps we could 
distinguish between uh, biomass and, and RDF, uh, you know, waste waste derived fuels? Um, yeah, Ian. I, I mean, as Tony says, um, not much really um, has been done. I think um, in South Africa, we've um, we've done a bit of tire bending um, in in the Western Cape. Um, it's still at very, very low levels. Um, other, other places in South Africa, not, uh, not really much. Um, I know most of the plants are really geared up for, for, for AFR banning, but it's, 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 it's for me AFR, except um, the legal framework, but it's also a matter of, um, you know, because AFR is, is more about the supply chain. You know, if you can sort out the supply chain, the collection sorting, you know, the, the processing part is actually for me is much more the simpler part, you know, but it's all a supply chain to get um, the alternative fuels to site. And, and for me, that's, that's just the, the one area that I think as an industry, we still need to work a lot more on, um, in collaboration with government to make sure that we can sort out um, the supply chain part of um, the AFR part of processing. Um, outside of South Africa, um, we, they are, I think the only place that has really made progress is, is, is Rwanda, where we actually, you know, I mean, we've, we've done quite a lot of uh, few stuff. Uh, we've been in rice ask, um, palm kennels um, yeah, to, to substitute coal, um, because coal in this market is, is generally quite expensive. And, and for us, AFR, it's uh, except the fact that it's it has got an impact on the on the carbon footprint, but it also has got a huge cost benefit. So we've done we've done quite uh, quite well in Rwanda with uh, with, uh, with with coal replacement or AFR. The unfortunate part is its availability. You know, it's it's limited uh, uh, supply. So we basically utilize whatever is available. But our plant um, in Rwanda is geared to really um, take um, quite a few. Uh, or, or a mixture of uh, different alternative fuels. Yeah, I, I think we see, we see this, this same issue as of availability uh, everywhere, in particular where the regulations are not um, uh, so strict on uh, throwing away household and industrial waste. I mean, it's always cheaper just to throw it away in a hole than it is to do, you know, to treat it in a sustainable fashion. So un until you have those kind of regulations, then the availability of, of, of waste derived fuel tends to be quite limited. Absolutely. And in Rwanda, we actually have this secular economy where, you know, we've got zero waste dump philosophy. You know, everything is recycled and we actually process it back into the, in the plant. So, so there, I think um, the legislation also allows, as you may know, uh, plastics are not allowed uh, in Rwanda, you know, except for maybe water bottles or, or juices. But other than that, uh, plastic is not uh, allowed in the country. So you don't have a lot of uh, plastics floating around uh, in that country. In terms of um, water bottles or juices, we actually process them in our plant. Uh, we collect and process them in our plant. So, so our waste, we actually have got zero waste going to, to any landfill site because there's not enough land for, um, to dump stuff. And um, in Zimbabwe, unfortunately, our kiln in Zimbabwe is not yet to really ban AFR. It's just, it's just got a, a very small calcina and we are looking at um, you know, options to, to increase the residence time of the calcina. Uh, we're brushing off some of the studies that has been done previously and see if it, uh, it makes sense in the first place or you know or maybe we need to to look at different technology for us to be able to process alternative fuels um, in terms of avail availability Zimbabwe also has got not a lot of um, of uh, alternative fuels available I think um, you know what we can rely on is mainly on the on the waste derived fuel, um, you know, or refuse derived uh, fuel. So, so that that uh, you know, it's 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 something that we still have to develop uh, jointly with uh, with the local governments and see whether it you know it, it might make sense. But we need to position ourselves at this stage, you know, from a technology point of view, make sure that the plant is ready and geared to be able to process AFR. Okay. Well, I think we're coming up to the limits of our time. So maybe before we finish, we could uh, uh, look forward a little bit and see what the, uh, uh, the outlook, uh, what each of you see in, in terms of an outlook. Uh, Tony, when, when I look at uh, Africa, you know, I'm struck by 
uh, overcapacity and, and a lot of uh, small plants, a lot of grinding stations, a lot of um, fragmented industries, clearly a lot of, of challenges in terms of building um, a profitable uh, future. But on the other hand, we've got uh, the prospect of attractive increases in demand over the next many years as, as Africa uh, urbanizes and we see uh, cement consumption rise from the current very low levels to something you know, closer to the global norm. And so when you look at all of that, I mean, what, what do you see as being the outlook for the next two or three years? Are there areas that you're particularly bullish on? Um, two to three years, five years. Um, I, I, I think, I think in, again, Eastern Southern Africa has been through some very difficult times. I, I believe Ethiopia has got a lot of potential. It reminds me of Nigeria 20 years ago. There's an awful lot of issues, but they can be solved and make a much better industry. Uh, as Clinker is coming on stream over the next two to three years, particularly in Kenya, that is going to transform the Kenyan, Rwandan, Ugandan, Southern Sudan, Eastern DRC markets. The grinding stations have already started going bankrupt. They will go bankrupt. There will be consolidation. And we're going to get to a situation where there are four or five players, all with operating off, let's call it local clinker, with an over over reliance on on um, on Kenya. There's there's more limestone. I think we'll see a little bit of weakness in prices further inland because as the clinker moves, capacity moves inland, the players are going to give up some of that, particularly some of the new entrants who don't understand necessarily or have a different view on strategy. Um, but I, I think those markets will be, be, be fairly, fairly positive. Um, Tanzania, diff difficult to call. Zambia is going to have too much capacity for a while. It's going to get hammered by the two new plants coming up in southern DRC. So I think that's a bit less easy. I think South Africa after whatever it is, seven years of price war, of really rough times. Uh, I, I'm not sure the market will grow particularly quickly, but I think, I think it will reach a better position. I think already we're seeing positive signs in, in, in South Africa. Nigeria, I have my concerns. There are only three players, but they're all operating on remarkably low utilization. Um, and... I do question how that's going to happen as Dangote is forced permanently to give up market share to uh, partic particularly to Boer. And as I said earlier in the call, West Africa, I think is going to go through a few years of, of turmoil. Across the continent, there will be growth. It's still very low, very low um, consumption per capita in general. So I think things will, will improve. In general, COVID has actually seen many markets stronger, um, particularly on the retail side. Will that continue? Will it, will it remains to be seen. But so we've seen consumption actually go up quite dramatically in many markets on the continent. Nigeria is up something like 15%, again, driven by people wanting to spend their Naira and those who have money wanting to develop the homes where they're staying in the village rather than in, in city life. So I think we've seen some interesting dynamics what, how do you forecast for 2021 is going to be more tricky, but certainly we've seen a, we've seen a boost in, 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 in many of those markets. Uh, so on, on macro Africa five years out, I think it will be a bit better. I think there'll be, there will be consolidation. Banks, as always, on a one-way street in cement, and even organizations like IFC seeing cement as, an, as a one-way uh, one-way train will going to be much more cautious. So yeah, I think it could be okay. I don't think it's going to be stellar, but I, I do think it's, we'll probably see a bit of a better structure in most markets over the coming five years. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Tony. And McCarthy, you're uh, responsible for PPC's business outside South Africa. Where's, where are the most exciting opportunities for you? Um, I, th I think what Tony says is it's 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 a similar trend that we've picked up in most of our markets, you know, especially during COVID, during the lockdown. 
um, significant increase in demand. Uh, and I think, you know, we came to the same conclusion, Tony, that, you know, people are earning money, they are based at home, you know, they are able to spend money on minor renovations because we've seen, we've seen very strong, strong demand across our markets. Um, but I think, I think it's it's very clear that this continent this 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 has to be some level of consolidations over the coming years. Um, if you look at um, the number of um, small grinding stations all over the continent in the eastern part, it's it's it cannot continue. Um, there's already a lot of them operating um, at very low utilization levels, um, and the banks are already you know. Um, looking at options in terms of what they can do with those assets because they cannot really live above water. What we see you know, in, in our markets, you know, I still believe um, you know, Rwanda um, will continue doing well. Um, we are finalizing um, our capacity upgrade project um, and in the next 18 months, we expect to be at full capacity. And that, that is a market that I think uh, will, will continue to grow. Um, I think if you look at the project pipelines, I was actually in the country last week and engaged some key stakeholders. Um, you know, the project pipeline remains fairly strong. Um, a city of Kigali, for example, I mean, spent 70% of their budgets on infrastructure projects, um, which is quite, quite, quite good for us uh, as an industry. And we've really partnered with uh, most of those um, uh, construction companies in Rwanda in delivering um, uh, uh, those projects. Um, what we see, and also in Ethiopia, I think I agree with Tony. And 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 by the way, Tony, you know, there's huge progress on our end with uh, our project in Abesha. Um, we're seeing really, um, you know, an uptick in terms of demand um, in Ethiopia, as you may have seen, announcement by government looking at importation of three million tons. I don't know where they, you know, the forex will come from, but um, we're seeing very strong demand uh, in the country, um, and and I think you know, the sooner we can get our plant to, um, to capacity, we'll actually, you know, benefit from, from that strong demand. And pricing has also gone up, which is quite great um, in that market, because you know, I, I do believe over the years, the pricing levels in Ethiopia were not sustainable. Um, and I think we gradually get into the pricing levels that um, the industry uh, can start um, to really breathe um, above the water. And Zimbabwe always, you know, defies all the logics of economics, uh, with all the, with all the um, not so great macroeconomic factors in Zimbabwe. Um, we we continue to do quite well in Zimbabwe. I think uh, we're seeing year on year uh, uh, increase in demand, um, and primarily driven by a lot of infrastructure projects that are also happening there. There's a small decline in the retail space, but uh, on the projection side, on the on the project side, we're seeing more and more projects uh, that are coming up uh, in the country. And yes, um, you know, we still we still not uh, at seventy percent capitalization, but I think there's 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 there are signs that um, gradually, you know, um, the market is picking up. I think for me, the concern um, in that market is the overcapacity that you find you, you find ourselves surrounded with. I mean, Zambia has got um, overcapacity, and with the, with the new plants coming up in Lubumbashi, and new facilities coming up in Lubumbashi, is going to really put a lot of pressure on on the northern market of Zimbabwe. Um, because that is uh, an obvious outlet uh, for the Zambian uh, producers, so we expect more and more, you know, pressure of imports coming into into the northern part of Zimbabwe as you know as Zambia becomes uh, um, uh, goes through this overcapacity situation. So yeah, I think um, the DRC is anybody's guess. I wish I had a crystal ball, <laughs> crystal clear ball to tell you what's going to happen there. Because you know, in terms of what we're seeing is, um, it's um, the market has been fairly stable, small growth. Um, you know, still really dependent on retail. Not a not a lot happening um, on projects. It's small projects that really don't uh, take a lot of volumes. Um, but yeah, it's it's anybody's guess whether it's gonna blow east or west. So it's a <laughs> it's a it's a it's a wait and see. Okay. So on on that um, uncertain note, um, I'd like to thank both of you very much for uh, participating today, and um, uh, perhaps I can take this opportunity to wish you both uh, Merry Christmas and. Um, 
Indeed, since this is probably the last podcast we'll have before Christmas, uh, all of our listeners a Merry Christmas and a much more successful, prosperous and healthy uh, 2021.